Let's try it. Check, check, check. One, two, one. Yeah, check, check, check. Okay. Okay. So it should be okay. Can I bring this down without breaking? I don't anything? think you need to. Just start well, talking. Just It'll be fine. Right oh, okay. Right. I was going to sit down, but uh, okay. This. Oh, one. you want to sit down? Well, yeah, that's fine. I can move it. This is good. No, this is fine. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you all set? Yep. Okay, everybody. All right. Um, Arthur Raymond Brooks. Um, he was a member of this uh, Air Force Association. Okay, and it was called the uh, Union Morris. Uh, Chapter 195 before it became a shooting star, and uh, it covered basically uh, Morris County, uh, Union County, and uh, Somerset as well. It was called Union, Union Morris until it, the name was changed to uh, Shooting Star <clears throat> based on the uh, next slide here. Let's see. Here we go based on the shooting star emblem on Arthur Raymond Brooks spot 13. You see the shooting star right there on the, on the right hand side. Um, There's the Jodfers that I thought they had. Pardon me? Uh, Those are the Jodfers in my father's picture. Is it, what are my your father father's was in World War One. Yes. And I said I have a picture of him with Jodfers. What, what are they? With Jodfers? The pants. pants. The oh, pants. The, pants. Oh, the pants. Okay. Yeah. They look like Snickers. Yeah. Okay. okay. Like sure. They, they come out at the sides and they... Boots. Yes, and by the way, uh, he had to buy his uniform and his boots. <clears throat> that was uh, <laughs> they, they weren't issued. They had to come yeah, everybody in four war one was given money uh, and they had to buy everything. Right. Okay. They had to buy everything. <clears throat> okay. Well, Arthur Raymond Brooks. He was born in uh, Framingham, uh, Massachusetts, uh, in uh, November first, uh, eighteen ninety-five, <gasps> and. Um, his father owned a granary uh, near a railroad uh, yard, um, and he sort of had a mechanical aptitude because um, he liked to build things. He built a raft, and he also built a uh, fishing boat, and also an ice boat that uh, he uh, he sailed during the winter across the pond, and it would go up to 60 miles an hour. So he liked speed. He graduated from the uh, Framington Academy in high school as an L. The valedictorian. He graduated from MIT in 1917 in electrochemistry. Uh, he applied to the Army Signal, Army Air Signal Corps, and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, well, for, first he did the Army Air Corps Signal Corps uh, application. They didn't get anything back, so he applied for the Army Corps of Engineers as well, and he got accepted to both. And he took both sets of orders into, uh, I guess, at the recruiting station. So, which, you know, what am I going to do? And uh, they said, Well, what do you want? To, what would you like to do? And he said, I'd like to fly. So they ripped up the ones for the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> and uh, and so he attended. Um, so he enlisted again, and that was. Uh, by the way, um, see, so he graduated in 1917. And um, the U.S. entered uh, the war, World War One. I. I mean, it had been going on for some time. The U.S. entered the war in April 6th of 1917. And uh, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary this, this past April. So that's how I got to, to do this talk, by the way. Uh, my Morris Plain Museum was putting together a uh, World War I display. And uh, <clears throat> I thought it'd be neat if uh, we could um, uh, dedicate a uh, Keith Ferris World War I print, which we did. Uh, of, uh, it was uh, old number one. It was the uh, spot like that that uh, Eddie Rickenbacker used. And he was the uh, number one American ace with, I think, 26 victories. And uh, the plane that uh, he used for the last 18, uh, Keith Ferris uh, painted. And uh, we have a print of that. And we designated, we um, framed it. And, uh, and with the help of Jim, we uh, dedicated it on um, the 8th of April, almost you know, close to the 100th anniversary of our entry into World War I. So, anyway, to get back to Brooks, um, so he trained, he trained with the, um, 
to the Military Aeronautics, School of Military Aeronautics, using the Jenny, JN4D, uh, with the Royal Flying Corps in Canada from September to November 7, 1917. Then, then he, uh, they went to Texas with 139th Squadron from uh, November 1917 to February 1918, using the jetty again as a, as a training plane. And then in March of 1918, he was transferred to France. And um, this shows him, okay, there. And then let's see, let's go a little farther here. Okay, here's uh, another um, plane. This is a plane 20. Okay, it doesn't have, well, it may have had the shooting star. We, we didn't, can't see it. Anyway, um, by the way, the, 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 the writing on, on these prints is by Arthur Raymond Brooks. Um, and you can see, uh, or maybe you can't see too well, but it's up, upper right, <clears throat> it says Arthur R. R. Brooks. Captain, uh, United States, I think it's uh, Army, Air Corps, or Reserve. And then it's, uh, does it say 139th? Yeah, yeah 139th. 139th. And 22nd uh, Aero Squadrons. And that was in the 2nd Pursuit Group. A group. Each group had about four, had four squadrons, and he's in the 2nd Pursuit Group. Um, and I can't remember. Yep. Yeah. And then the, the, the names of the, um, the crew, so the, the crew was written on there by him as well. <clears throat> so after his first victory in the 139th, he became captain of the 22nd Aero Squadron, and he designed the uh, Shooting Star emblem. And um, after 120, he, he completed 120 missions within five months, by the way, uh, he didn't expect to live because the life expectancy of a, a pilot in World War I was like uh, two or three weeks. I mean, you know. <laughs> they, and you'll, you'll understand why. You see the open cockpit, they had no parachute. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, a lot of them were cavalry officers before they came, became pilots. And uh, they thought that uh, taking a, a, you know, using a parachute was, was being chicken or something like that. And that if, um, if you had a parachute, that the pilot would be more apt to, to uh, not fight and just, you know, jump out of the airplane. <laughs> so that, you know, for various reasons, they didn't have parachutes. Let's see. I think the balloon is still <laughs> okay, here's uh, here's the aerodrome um, <clears throat> in uh, Tour France. Now you see those are two spots. One is uh, you see the 22 on one. I'm, I'm not sure if there's a 20 on the other one or not. But you see the uh, <clears throat> yeah. You see the S S is a spot, right? You see that? Yeah. And uh, of course, on the wing they have the uh, U.S. emblem. Was that Roundel or the last unit aircraft in the United States? Pardon me? It was a round one. Oh, yeah. Are you talking about the uh, round emblem on top? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's U.S. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them had the, the, uh, the round emblems. Yeah, that was. Well, the French have one and the English have one. Yeah, they, they all had round. They had round circles, but they had different colors, different colors right. in the center. And um, I'm not sure which. The U.S. had either a red or in the center. It's hard to tell from that picture. Yeah, you can't tell. You're right. Absolutely. It's just black and white. Right. Right. Okay. Anyway, he, he flew uh, four four spots, and they were, they were named uh, Smith, one, two, three, and four. They were named Smith uh, because he didn't want to name his plane after his uh, uh, fiance Ruth, because he didn't want you know uh, somebody to say, well uh, you know Ruth is down because you know got shot up by a tail or something like that. So 
<laughs> he named his plane Smith and because that's where she was going to college. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So anyway, um, let's see. Um, a little more about his career. Uh, well, let's see. See, I, I guess we should go through the uh, slides and then we'll go into the videos. Yeah, okay. So let's take the next one. Okay. I'll just go, okay. Before he got <clears throat> to this uh, facility, um, he, um, he came back. His, his plane, um, Smith 4, was shipped back uh, to, uh, you know, uh, for bond drives. And uh, eventually wound up in the uh, Garber uh, Smithsonian facility, storage facility, and uh, I think it's Silver Springs or something like Silver Lake, uh, Maryland. Okay, and that's where this this, this picture is taken. But anyway, he um, he resigned from the uh, army in 1922, and uh, he uh, he continued on aviation. Uh, he flew for the Army Reserve, and he worked for the United States Commerce Department surveying air routes and supervising installation of beacons to help pilots navigate the, uh, you know, the mountains. Uh, and uh, he set up uh, beacons, navigation beacons. Now, Bob, you said something about that you knew about his beacon activity, or you flew using his beacons or something like that. Is that true? <laughs> I said it is true. That's <laughs> not <laughs> true. That's true, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't remember. Okay. All right. Anyway, he was involved in uh, uh, contract airmail Route 10. He worked for the U.S. Department of Commerce <laughs> Aeronautics Branch, and he was responsible for surveying what become the nation's first air routes. And uh, these are air routes were U.S. mail routes, <clears throat> and he uh, set up uh, beacons. Um, that we go from like New Jersey up to Maine, or from New Jersey down to uh, Virginia, or from New Jersey out to Pennsylvania. And he set up these every about every 20 miles would be a, a light beacon for navigation at night. They used and, the high railroad lines. Yeah, I guess during the day you you, you, you can see where you're going. Yeah. But during the night you needed some beacons. So he was involved in doing that. Um, and the midpoint was in here in New Jersey. So that's how I think he got to here in New Jersey. He moved to New Jersey, okay, from Massachusetts. And uh, then he, uh, he he worked with uh, Bell Labs from 1928 to 1960, uh, you know, developing uh, radio telephone communications, affecting uh, radar during the war, and uh, air to ground communications. And um, he flew a tri-motor Ford. In fact, uh, remember Bob Hodges, uh, when he grew up, he would uh, sometimes he'd go out to like Brookside, and from Brookside he could see this tri-motor Ford flying when he was visiting family out there, and that was probably Ray Brooks flying. So in 1936, um, he made a call to his wife in uh, Short Hills, I think. It, 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 eventually, he moved to uh, Summit. And in Short Hills, he made a call to his wife. And uh, she said, uh, she answered the phone. She says, I can't hear you too well because there's some fool that's flying outside. <laughs> and he said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so moving forward to this, uh, to this period here, about 1985, I, um, he was visiting the Smithsonian Institution National Air and Space Restoration Facility in Silver Hill, Maryland, with a family member. And upon entering the storage hangar, as part of the tour, he spotted a, uh, okay, the spot, as you can see there. As he drew near the aircraft, he was astonished to discover it was his very own aircraft. He climbed into the cockpit, and the uh, technician told him to get out. <laughs> you're, de you're destroying property. And uh, anyway, they, you know, realized that it was his plane and uh, uh, they got uh, the historian there was uh, Gerber um, 
Garber is the uh, was the historian for the Smithsonian, aviation historian for them, and they established uh, quite a relationship. Anyway, um, they restored this plane, and uh, when Brooks was 90, they um, displayed it at the Air and Space Museum at the dedication, and he was there, and. <clears throat> I have, and then they interviewed him. They have some, and I have some interviews on uh, some of the uh, tracks on this DVD. So, let's see. Go further. That's the right. That's that's a that's a that's a photo. That's a photo I, I took that about five years ago, and you can see clearly see the uh, you know the shooting star, the twenty, and then if you look closely above, let's see. Yes, it doesn't work. Yeah. I guess it's better than that. I was going to show you. See, up on the first, uh, up by the, you can see Smith 4. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't look at it. Don't point at anybody. Yeah, I guess it's better than that. Yeah. I'm going to point it out on there. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. You see Smith 4. That's right there. Smith 4. Oh. Yeah. Where yeah. is that again? Smith 4. Smith 4, right there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So you don't need technology. No. <clears throat> so, um, let's see. So anyway, uh, lesson after they he uh, maintained an active interest in uh, flying into his 90s. He, re he attended many reunions. Uh, let's see. I, I, next. Uh, here is his uh, tri-motor, Ford tri-motor, and yeah, his chief pilot, 1928 to 1960, yeah. And here are some of the reunions. Uh, he used to go to the Ronnie Beck reunion. You can see in the left-hand side, they got the shooting star on that little truck. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. And then the right is, uh, he used, that, that's, 90, that's October um, uh, 1988. And he used to go the last Sunday in October to all the to to Rhinebeck uh, Field and their uh, display. Is that him in a wheelchair? Yeah. yeah, he's in the wheelchair. He's in the wheelchair, and it's Cole Palin uh, right next to him. Cole Palin. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Should they have spats at the Rhinebeck, right? Yeah, they still have. Them. Yeah. Okay, at ninety, he was going strong. Okay, and. Um, there was an, a series of articles, uh, well, this, this whole article was put together by, can you read it? No. You want me to read it for you? Jack no. Elliott. Jack Elliott. Yeah. You know who Jack Elliott is, right? No. He's a member of our oh. chapter. He was. He is not. And uh, I, I mentioned to uh, S.A. and his uh, wife that we were doing this talk, but um, she she had another appointment. I guess she had a driving uh, session or something like that. You know, safe driving. She couldn't make it. And I guess Jack is um, not too mobile. But Jack Elliott wrote this article. And uh, on the right-hand side is uh, Arthur Raymond Brooks, okay, at 90. And there's uh, Paul Garber. The, uh, at, this, at that time, the... Um, Historian Emeritus from uh, Smithsonian. Now, uh oh, what do I do? Well, your so on. I think you ran out of print to the end of your presentation. Uh oh, okay, wow. Well, now there was one, there was another piece to it. Let's see. You can't go there, okay. Oh, it's, uh, let's see. What do you think? Tell me. There's one thing. Why don't you click on the slideshow? Okay. Then you're going to fill it again. Okay. Oh. Okay, I'll quickly go through this. The one thing, we have one slide left. Oh, no. Same thing happened. Same thing happened. Thank you. I don't know why. I got something wrong here. It's okay. I thought there was one there. Okay, that's it, right there. Oh, <coughs> uh, okay. Um, whoops, you okay? 
I guess we can't read that too well, right? Um, can you read it? No, okay. We get you want to read it for us? No, I'll get it. Wait a minute. <laughs> Back up copies here. Okay. Yeah. Paul Barber himself. Yeah. Paul. Paul Garber wrote this poem to Ray Brooks uh, on his 90th birthday. And uh, I thought we could read it together, but uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, o to Ray Brooks. Fill up your glasses and raise them on high. We'll all drink a toast to the man in the sky. Here's to Ray Brooks, hail hearty and mighty. We salute you, dear Ray, as your age becomes 90. Many years have passed since that day long ago when President Wilson said, Kaiser, no, no. You can't keep on sinking our ships on the sea. We'll make the world safe for democracy. So on April 6, 1917, we entered the war and our Raymond got keen. He said to that girl at Smith College, by and by, I'm off to enlist and learn how to fly. Your name will forever stay close to my heart when I holler contact so my engine will start. But I won't write your name on the side of my plane for the Germans to look at and then to take aim. The name of Smith College will help win the war, reminding me of that dear girl I adore. So thus he enlisted and learned about wings the engines, propellers, and all flying things. He learned silver wings for, he earned silver wings for his shirt and his jacket, and went off to France and all that World War racket. He piloted airplanes, Smith one, two, three, four, and his victory six helped win the World War. At last he came home to the USA, and to his surprise and delight one fine day, in Washington, there in a museum, he saw an airplane that caused him to say, Wee! Hooray! There was Smith Four, the same spot he'd been flying when he became an ace, but almost became dying. When an enemy bullet cut his rudder controls and three other shots made some big windshield holes. Now in the museum, with a shout of delight, he greeted his airplane, a beautiful sight. Being more nimble then, he climbed into the seat and shouted, Now this makes my day more complete. With one hand on the stick and the other on the throttle, then wiggled the rudder, and then he said, What'll I do now? Where someone to pull on the prop? But suddenly there came a man shouting, Stop! What do you mean sitting there in that seat? Get out, I say, get out, I repeat. Who are you that's sitting where you should not sit? Who are you that dares to be in that cockpit? Then Ray said, I have the right. It's my airplane. I flew it in France and I want it again. To relive my memory, so I transgressed. I'd done it no harm, Twas thus he confessed. He said, I'm Ray Brooks, and those gravestones there on the fuselage show you that I did my share. Then he who had shouted stop exclaimed, Oh, dear Ray. I wanted to meet you for many a day. Sit there as long as you want, but for me, what's much better, when you get home, please write me a letter. Tell me all the details you remember and more of the story of yourself in this spad, Smith Four. Thus a friendship began that continues today with curator Paul and World War I ace Ray. I always will treasure the friendship we share God bless you, dear Ray, every day, everywhere. It's Paul Garber, October 9, 29, 1985. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. That's uh, really nice. Um, Thank you. Clap for that. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, we'll go to the video. <laughs> Let's see if we get the video going. You can turn the mic off. We don't need that. Okay. Sure.